Hi, thanks very much for joining me for another edition of 15 Minutes with Father Greg. Really appreciate all the positive feedback we've received and the questions that have been submitted. As always, if you have a question about our Catholic faith, feel free to follow the links below uh, to access a Google document wherein you can submit a question, either with your name or anonymously. This weekend is a really joyful one for me personally because just as this video is being published, I will be preparing to preside at the wedding of my cousin David to his beautiful and amazing bride, Catherine. It won't be happening here at St. Gerard's, but at another parish not too far away in our diocese. This will be the second wedding since the beginning of the uh, pandemic that I'll be presiding at. It's really been a really crazy few months, as we know. So many things, so many plans have been upended, especially brides and grooms who have been planning their wedding. So what we'll be doing is having a rather simple wedding mass at their parish and then a modest gathering back at their home. And like many other brides and grooms, they will be delaying their big reception with the extended family and many friends sometime next summer. So for now, we'll be gathering to celebrate a wedding that is still the sacrament of matrimony. Even just about a week after we were allowed to have gatherings um, here at the parish, I had the privilege of presiding at my friends Alec and Nikki at their wedding right here in our own chapel. Weddings are extraordinary moments filled with great joy, great promise, because they are the beginning of a new chapter, not only in the bride and groom's life, but in the life of their family as well, as two families really unite to become one. So it's got me thinking a lot about a common question that I hear, and that is, Father, how come there aren't more weddings like there used to be at church? Well, undeniably, we've seen a trend of more and more couples choosing to be uh, married, to have the ceremony, at some place outside of church, maybe at the venue where the reception will be, maybe on the beach, maybe in a vineyard, um, some other place that seems, I don't know, more beautiful or somehow has an appeal to the couple. But for us as Catholics, we have the obligation, if you will, to have our wedding at a church inside that sacred space. And a lot of people I know will disagree with this or at least will say, well, Father, that might be fine for some people, but I prefer to be married elsewhere. So let me just take a few moments to explain the importance of having a wedding inside a church. It comes down very simply to this. Solemn occasions require solemn locations. So if you think about the inauguration of a, a president or a governor will take place typically at the capital of the country or the state. We have appropriate places for major celebrations, hallmark moments in the lives not only of individuals but of society. But for us as Christians, the church has a very particular meaning. It's because when a bride and groom unite themselves in holy matrimony, they are taking upon themselves the obligation and the promise to love and to live as Christ for the other. So gathering in a sacred space is filled with symbolism and with deep meaning. Think about the other occasions in our lives. We have baptisms, first communions, and confirmation. For those of us called to uh, the ordained life, we have our ordination. All of these moments take place in the context of a church in that sacred setting. The same is true for Catholic marriage. We are meant to go up to the altar of God. And that's a really important point because brides and grooms inside the church make their vows before the altar. Why? Because the altar is the chief symbol of Christ. We say that Christ on the cross is both victim and priest and that wood is the altar on which he offers his life for the world. That's the same radical, selfless love that men and women are called to in the sacrament of matrimony. So it's only fitting that we gather in that sacred space for that sacred moment. You know, in Judaism, we see this great uh, sentiment throughout the scriptures of going up to the altar of God, going up to Jerusalem, going up to the temple. 
We know that our blessed Lord many times went to the temple as any devout Jew, certainly a rabbi would. In fact, some of his greatest teachings take place inside the temple and in its precincts around. The reason is because the temple is the heart of the faith. It is the place where we encounter God in a most powerful way. So for us, it is essential that we recognize that place as a moment of encounter between each other, but more importantly, between us and God. You see, the Catholic sensibility of marriage is that it's not just the bride and groom, but that we are inviting, we are requesting, we are imploring God to be with us. And God unites us together. So we gather in the church for that most sacred moment. Now, are there exceptions? Some people have asked, Father, can I possibly be married outside of a physical church? The short answer is yes, with the local bishop's permission. And there are some occasions where that might be given. In the case of a Catholic marrying a non-Christian, maybe a, a Jewish person or a Muslim person, because of the sensibilities of families, the local bishop may give the permission to have the wedding take place in a space that is not uh, a church. So there are exceptions, but they are rather rare. Because if two Christians, and certainly a Catholic, and two Catholics are being married, it should be taking place inside a church. I know some people will say, but you know, God is everywhere. He's at the beach, he's at the vineyard. He's present even in a catering hall with family and friends gathered. Yes, God is there, undoubtedly. But we also recognize, almost instinctively, that God is most particularly present in a very special way inside the church. So we come before the altar, before the cross. We come before Jesus Christ himself, imploring him for that grace to live the life of sacrificial love. You know, I love presiding at weddings. It's one of my great joys as a priest, and especially this weekend as I do so for my family, as I have before. The celebration of the sacrament of matrimony is a rather ancient one and a rather simple and yet so beautiful a sign of giving life to another and laying down one's life for the other. There are two things, you might say, that are exchanged. There's the exchange of vows and the exchange of rings. But before we reach that point, the priest or the deacon who is presiding will invite the couple to come before the altar and they, ask, ans excuse me, they answer three questions. So reading right from the wedding ritual. The first question is, have you come here to enter into marriage without coercion, freely and wholeheartedly? In other words, is this something that you really want to do? Is this something that you are doing freely? Not because you're feeling any pressure not because you're feeling like this is an expectation that you kind of have to do this. Are you doing this because you want to? Are you doing this freely? The second question is, are you prepared as you follow the path of marriage to love and honor each other for as long as you both shall live? You know, sometimes I ask a couple uh, prior to their wedding in the course of our conversations and planning and preparing, I'll ask them, say, what do you think ends a marriage? After a few moments of thinking, they'll often respond with something like, well, infidelity, a lack of communication, a lack of intimacy, somehow people growing apart over time. And I listen and I say, well, those are very common answers, but they're wrong. There's only one thing that ends marriage, and that is death. Now, I realize I'm saying this uh, in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary that a lot of marriages end in divorce. In fact, sadly, upwards of half of marriages today throughout our country end in divorce, sadly. And for many of the reasons I just mentioned, but for us in our Catholic understanding, it is a lifelong commitment. So in a few moments, I'll talk about what it means to obtain an annulment, which some people often uh, misunderstand in the church's teaching. But the bride and groom, standing before the altar, promise lifelong fidelity and commitment to each other. And then finally, the priest or deacon will ask, are you prepared to accept children lovingly from God 
and bring them up according to the law of Christ and his church. You see, the purpose of marriage is not only that a man and a woman can walk together in love and in unity, but the fruit of that love be children, a family, to hand on the faith, to hand on our Christian identity, to fill the world and subdue it with the message of Christ, the gospel. That's a serious part of the commitment of marriage, is being open to that gift of life. So those are the three questions that begin the marriage ritual. Then there is the exchange of vows. Now, what I love about that moment is the bride and groom hold each other's hands in that moment. Every time I present at a wedding, I can't help but think of the moment when I was ordained and before I actually had hands laid on me by the bishop, the act of ordination, a man first goes up and places his folded hands inside the bishop's hands. And he promises respect and obedience for the rest of his life. I can't help but see that great uh, complementarity in the sacrament of matrimony. As a husband and wife join hands and they pledge to be Christ to each other. They promise to love like God each other for the rest of their lives. That respect, that obedience to the other, laying down their life each day. There's such a power in that moment as the words they exchange are demonstrated in their holding hands. And then, as a further sign, they offer each other a ring. Now, it's quite obvious a ring has uh, no beginning and no end, much like God's love for us. It is endless. It is timeless. And so the ring is placed on the hand of the other as a sign of love and fidelity. You see, the marriage ritual is ancient. This idea of unifying two people was part of God's plan for humanity from the very outset. We, many, many, many generations later, still live in that great tradition. And so for such a sacred moment, naturally, a church, our most sacred space, is really the only fitting setting for such an occasion. Now, I've also been asked about what you do when you experience difficulties in marriage. And undoubtedly, every marriage will have that at some point. It might be major, it might be minor, but it's important for us to remember that we make a commitment, we make vows in the sacrament of matrimony, which means we also promise to work on those things that are going wrong, the things that might be a bit broken or nearing the breaking point. Marriage is a daily commitment and one that needs to be worked on day by day, just as I have grown in my priesthood over 11 plus years, day by day. We're works in progress, and so it never really ends, and we never get perfect at it, but we're meant to continually try. So if we are experiencing difficulty in our vocation, especially those in the sacrament of matrimony, it's important to put in every effort to work on that. There are a lot of resources. There are certainly counselors. And one particular resource I'd like to recommend for you or someone that you know that might need assistance in marriage is Retrovile. We're actually going to post a, a link to their website uh, below this video. This is a program, a, a weekend program with some, um, you might say, uh, further work throughout the year that's been developed over a number of decades that has seen great success in helping troubled marriages reach stability and grow in health. Their success rate is really quite superb. So I encourage you or someone that you know, if you need that resource, please avail yourself of it. Again, we know that not every marriage has a happy ending. Sometimes there are things that lead to divorce. And for us as Catholics, it is important to remember that if there was to be a remarriage, that first a person needs to seek an annulment from the church. Now some might call an annulment Catholic divorce. That's not true. What an annulment is, is an investigation into what led up to the marriage. Because there are a lot of ingredients that go into marriage. 
there has to be an adequate understanding of and appreciation for the sacrament of matrimony. There has to be reasonable maturity on the part of both the bride and the groom. And sometimes those things are simply lacking. Despite our best efforts, or perhaps even if we might be blind to some problems, they can still exist. The church wants to accompany us on that path of healing. I've worked with a lot of priests and lay people who assist in the annulment process, and they are extraordinary. In fact, many of them have remarked that it is really a ministry of healing, helping a man and a woman close one chapter to learn from it so that they can move on in freedom. The divorce process can sometimes be rather difficult, but the annulment process is meant to be an agent of healing, of closure, and to learn in moving ahead for the future. Finally, there are some people who perhaps for whatever reason were not married in a church. So they're both Catholic, but they decide to get married at the venue or at the beach. So what about them? Well, the church has a process by which you can receive the sacrament of matrimony. We call it a convalidation, meaning that we recognize obviously that the couple is married civilly, but they wish to receive the sacrament of matrimony. So very simply, they can go to their parish priest or deacon and begin the process for preparing for the sacrament of matrimony. In my years as a priest, I've done some convalidations where the couple was married maybe a few months. One time, a couple had been married for 40 years, but decided after a lot of prayer and thought that they wanted to be married in the church. And so on their 40th wedding anniversary, I convalidated their marriage. This sort of thing is done on the parish level, whereas the um, annulment process is done on a diocesan level. I'm also going to include below this video a link to some more information about the annulment process if you or someone you know might be interested. So thanks very much for joining me for this uh, few moments to speak about the great, beautiful sacrament of matrimony. As always, we pray for those who are called to that great vocation. We pray for their fidelity. We pray for their joy and their enthusiasm in taking up that great call to love as Christ, their bride or groom, to love their family, and to be a witness to us of God's love for all of creation. Thanks very much again for joining. Please be sure to like and share this video, and also make sure that you're subscribing to all of our social media platforms. God bless you and your families in these summer days.